Good afternoon. My name is Karen Hostetter and I am the library manager at Redland Community Library in Edders, York County, Pennsylvania. We are delighted to welcome our presenter, Phaedra Patrick, and all of our attendees to this One Book, One Community event today. The One Book Initiative began in 2004 and a steering committee was formed with representatives from each of the participating counties to present a good discussable book. At present, we have 40 plus libraries in Cumberland, Dauphin, Perry, and York counties, and some independent libraries, including Hershey Public Library and Middletown Public Library, along with our community partners and bookstores. For many of those years, a separate selection committee narrowed the selection to a final choice that was announced to our readers. But several years ago, we invited our loyal readers to choose the book from three to five finalists. Kathy Hale, chair of the selection committee, will now explain how the selection committee reads and whittles down their choices. Hi, my name is Kathy Hale. I work at the State Library of Pennsylvania. I have been the head of the selection committee for about two years now. We start out with about 70 books that are selected by the people on our selection committee. We have about 20 people. The year that we selected Phaedra's book, there were about 70 to start with we try and have some criteria about it can't be larger than 400 pages and we want to be able to have libraries be able to program different things in their libraries around the book that's chosen. So we want to thank Phaedra for being here today. The Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper was one of her first books and she has won a number of different awards. First of all, The Curious Charms is published in 24 different languages. It was part of the Great Northwest Read. It is a Listen List winner from 2017. And Phaedra is one of the USA Today best selling authors. She also won an award called the Prix de Lectrices Milady, and that is an award in France for different fiction and nonfiction books that the, the readers vote on as their favorite book. So she went from an award winning yeah, short story author to her novels. So there is a lot that we will want to ask Phaedra and listen to Phaedra about how she writes and how she comes to her characters. Lots of things that we're going to find out about the book and the author. So Karen, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Phaedra is joining us today from her home in Saddleworth, Northwest United Kingdom. She qualified firstly as a stained glass artist before gaining her professional marketing qualifications. She's worked as a waitress, as a stained glass designer, a film festival organizer, and a communications manager. Fedra enjoyed her first real writing success when she entered and won several short story competitions, and she now writes full time. She lives in Saddleworth with her husband and son, and it might be tea time in England. So I'm joining Fedra with a cup of my favorite awesome tea. Welcome to Pennsylvania, Fedra. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and it's brilliant to join you. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I just want to say thank you for everybody at One Book, One 
community for organising this. Must be a massive amount of work to look through 70 books and whittle them down and get everybody involved and voting. So I'm absolutely honoured that The Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper has been selected as your winner. Um, and I just really hope that anybody who has read the book has, has enjoyed uh, joining Arthur on his journey. I think um, a lot of us are, are kind of locked down in our own homes because of the virus at the moment. So um, actually being able to join Arthur on his journey out and about in the world, um, I'm hoping that's been a nice experience for people. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my writing journey, a little bit about myself, how I became a writer and how I came to write The Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper. And I always say, uh, you kind of read these stories, don't you, in magazines and newspapers about writers and they pick up a pen for the first time and they write a book and it's snapped up for um, a large figure, you know, an agent and publisher. And that's amazing, you know, my career starts off well that's not me that didn't happen for me that way um it took a long long journey uh, for me to become a writer many rejections along the way I think if there's any writers out there um watching this then hopefully you know if you're going through that journey as well um this my story might kind of hopefully give you a bit of hope or help along the way but um I kind of knew I wanted to be a writer from about the age of eight years old but well, I kind of live in um, a little small cotton town um, in England called Oldham and um, just the thought of being a writer I just thought that people like me and people from my town didn't do anything like that I thought we kind of got jobs in the, the cake factory you know putting cherries on top of cakes and things like that so actually having this ambition at an early age was very strange and I didn't tell anyone about it and I do remember going to a playground with other children when I was around eight. And um, there was a roundabout. Do you have roundabouts in, in America? Mm -hmm. I mean, just stand on them and they go round, the children's go round. And I remember standing there thinking, I wonder where the word roundabout originated. And then I thought, that's a really strange thought for a kid to have. You know, I should be there playing and I'm, and I'm thinking about the origins of this word. Well, the thing was, there was no way to find out because there was no internet um, at that stage. Now you just Google anything, don't you? But at that stage, I thought, how do you find out about the origins of the English language? And the library in our town, you know, it only had a certain amount of books. And we just had like one bookstore that was mainly kind of, you know, novels, textbooks. So... Uh, I just kind of buried it. I just kind of buried these weird thoughts and ideas um, and ambitions. And I also thought that all authors were kind of aristocrats. You know, they all wore um, dressing gowns and smoked long cigarettes, you know, and came from the, the royal family. Uh, so again, I just thought, no, I can't possibly do that. So it wasn't till my 20s um, and I kind of worked in design and then in, in marketing um, and kind of this desire to write kind of reared up again. And what I used to do was I just used to go to the bookshop every single lunchtime. I'd go to the bookshop and I would just look at all the books on the shelf and I would read the little synopses on the back and see who the agents were for that book and who were the publishers. And I kind of just started amassing this little mine of information in my head because it wasn't just about the writing it was about the business side of it as well I just really interested in the industry so I started to write in secret didn't tell anyone didn't tell any of my family and um, I wrote about six books six novels and each one took about a year at a time and um, and I even got an agent for two of them I got a literary agent to represent me for two of them but she couldn't get me a publishing deal. So it was kind of, every time I took a step forward, it was like a step back. I just didn't seem to be getting anywhere. And that, that took a long, long time. Um, and I remember saying to my agent, I really want to write, but I just don't know what to write. And I remember as she said to me, she said, can you write sex midwives or thrillers? Because that's what I'm looking for. And I thought, I can't write any of those things because I can't write the next Fifty Shades of Grey because I'm just not interested in that. 
Um, I can't write a thriller and I don't know anything about midwives. So at that stage, I thought I need to take a break because obviously me and this agent aren't a good fit and I just don't know what to write. So that's when I started writing some short stories. So I'm still writing, but not um, novels for a while. So I just entered a few short story competitions and I just really recommend that for anybody who wants to write. Um, because actually taking on a novel is a huge task. You're looking at like 90,000 words, you know, maybe a year of your time. But actually, if you start small with short stories, you can really, you know, it's a good way of practicing. And there's usually lots of short story competitions out there. You can send off your entries, maybe get a bit of feedback. And it's just a really nice way of, of easing yourself in and getting a foot in the door. So The Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper, when I came to write that, that was going to be my last ever book that I wrote. So if this one didn't make it, that was it. I was going to stop it because they just take so long to do and you get all the rejections through and um, you get feedback, you know, like the market's saturated or we don't want that book, we're looking for that book. And um, yeah, it's just taken so much time. So with The Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper, what I decided to do with this one was I didn't want to write it like anyone else's book or write it for agents or write it for publishers or write it for the marketplace. This one I thought I'm just going to write for myself and I'm just going to write the story that I want to tell and I'm going to really enjoy it and I'm just going to tell a story really from my heart that means something to me. So again it's like what do I what do I do? So I remember telling my son the story behind my charm bracelet. So this is my little silver childhood charm bracelet. And he's 15 now. But um, when he was smaller, we had a rainy day and I got my charm bracelet out. And I was telling him the story behind each of the charms. And there's no interesting stories behind mine. <laughs> They're just ones that my auntie bought and my mum bought. And one spells like my name or... We've got one for, you know, a seaside town and that kind of thing. But as I was showing him, I thought that would make a really interesting story to have almost a short story for each of the charms on a bracelet. And it was also a time that a close friend of mine had, had died. Um, she, she died very young in her late 30s, early 40s. And we were very close when I was younger. I was a bridesmaid at a wedding and she sadly passed away. So... I was kind of thinking about bereavement um, a lot as well and I thought wouldn't that be interesting to kind of combine the two um, you know bereavement and a charm bracelet and um, all the books had been rejected for had all been about young women and the feedback kept coming back the market saturated for books about young women um, so I thought well if I write a book about an older gentleman they can't reject it for that reason <laughs> But a bit about being a young lady. So I've got these elements coming in place, a charm bracelet, bereavement, this older gentleman. And um, I had the Life of Pi DVD, you know, with the tiger on the front of Life of Pi. And I thought, gosh, I really wish I could have a tiger in my story. And for a long time, I just I thought, well, no, I can't, you know, because it's set in England. And then I just thought, you know what, this is my story and this is the story that I want to tell. And if I want to put a tiger in the story, I'm going to put a tiger in the story. So as soon as I put the tiger in, that gave me permission to actually just take Arthur on his journey to wherever I wanted him to go to. Um, it kind of gave me permission to do that. And also just think about locations that I've been to in it enjoyed. So I've been to India, I've been to France, I've been to London. So I thought, well, so I don't have to do much research about places that I've not been to, I will send Arthur to those places. So it was a little bit like, um, you know, when you get home from work, busy day at work, and you open your cupboard doors, you want to make something for your dinner, and make, um, and you open up your cupboard and you've got nothing in the cupboard. But if you look closely on the shelves, you start maybe finding, you know, maybe some herbs, maybe a can of beans, putting it all together. What ingredients do, do I have? And actually, you might have some things in front of you that you can make a nice casserole from. From thinking you've got nothing, you kind of start looking at inspiration in your own life. You know, just what, what things inspire you, what makes you laugh, where do you like to go to, what do you like to wear, what, um, what things are you passionate about. All those little elements can kind of come together and make um, a story that's personal to you. So that's how I kind of came up with 
The Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper. And it tells about this elderly gentleman who finds the mysterious charm bracelet in his late wife's wardrobe. And he sets on by, off on this journey of adventure and discovery to find out the story behind each of the charms one by one and discovers that his wife led a secret life before they met. So this was the one that made it. I sent it off and uh, to five agents and the first offer came through. I got four agents interested in representing it. And um, I went with my favorite um, at the top of my list, which was Darley Anderson. I'd seen Darley on a TV program years before. He was driving a car with a cat sat on his shoulder, this literary agent with his cat on his shoulder on TV. And I just thought one day, I feel I'm going to be connected to that man just a really strong feeling. And so when his agency offered to represent the book, I knew he was the right fit. And they sold it in 24 countries uh, for me, 24 different languages. Um, the film rights got optioned in Los Angeles um, by an American film company who still got the rights. They've had the rights for about four or five years and we're working on a script. So we don't know if it'll ever be made, but um, it's got to kind of script stage. So that's been really interesting. And I'd just like to read a passage from the book for you. So this is right at the beginning of the book and we meet Arthur and he's going about his daily routines as normal. His wife sadly passed away a year ago and um, there's a knock on his door. So it's just two pages and this is one of my favourite passages from the book. Arthur had just cleaned his worktop and was heading for his front room when a loud noise pierced his skull. He instinctively pressed his back against the wall. His fingers spread out against magnolia wood chip. Sweat prickled his underarms. Through the daisy patterned glass of his front door, he saw a large purple shape looming. He was a prisoner in his own hallway. The doorbell rang again. It was amazing how loud she could make it sound like a fire bell. His shoulders shot up to protect his ears and his heart raced. Just a few more seconds and surely she'd get fed up and leave. But then the letterbox opened. Arthur Pepper, open up. I know you're in there. It was the third time this week that his neighbour, Bernadette, had called around. For the past few months, she'd been trying to feed him up with her pork pies or homemade mince and onion. Sometimes he gave in and opened the door, but most of the time he did not. Last week, he had found a sausage roll in his hallway, peeking out of its paper bag like a frightened animal. It had taken him ages to clear up the flakes of pastry from his hessian welcome mat. He had to hold his nerve. If he moved now, she'd know he was hiding. Then he'd have to think of an excuse. He was putting out the bins or watering the geraniums in the garden. But he felt too weary to invent a story, especially today of all days. I know you're in there, Arthur. You don't have to do this on your own. You have friends who care about you. The letterbox rattled. A small lilac leaflet with the title Bereavement Buddies drifted to the floor. It had a badly drawn lily on the front. Although he hadn't spoken to anyone for over a week, although all he had in his fridge was a small chunk of cheddar and an out-of-date bottle of milk, he still had his pride. He would not become one of Bernadette Patterson's lost causes. Arthur! He screwed his eyes shut and pretended he was a statue in the garden of a stately home. He and Merriam used to love visiting National Trust properties, but only during the week when there were no crowds. He wished the two of them were there now, their feet crunching on gravel paths, marvelling at cabbage white butterflies fluttering among the roses, and looking forward to a big slice of Victoria sponge in the tea room. A lump rose in his throat as he thought about his wife, but he held his pose. He wished he could be made of stone so he couldn't hurt any more. Finally, the letterbox snapped shut. The purple shape moved away. Arthur let his fingers relax first and then his elbows. He wriggled his shoulders to relieve the tension. Not totally convinced that Bernadette wasn't lurking by the garden gate, he opened his front door by an inch. Pressing his eye against the gap, he appeared around outside. In the garden opposite, Terry, who wore his hair in dreadlocks, tied with a red bandana and who was forever mowing the lawn, was heaving his mower out of his shed. The two red-headed kids from next door were running up and down the street wearing nothing on their feet. Pigeons had pebble-dashed the windscreen of his disused micro. 
Arthur began to feel calmer. Everything was back to normal. Routine was good. And that's the start of Arthur. And my husband says that um, Arthur was based on me <laughs> because he says I'm the kind of person that if people did bang on the door, I might go and hide, you know, because I'm quite shy. Uh, so a lot of Arthur comes from me. And I think one of the delights for me was that the book was published in America because it's such a different um, country. But uh, the publisher said that the, um, the comedy and the warmth kind of translated to America. And I found that when I came over, I've been over three times and visited about 14 states. And I just found the people out there so warm and friendly and sharing very similar values and a very similar sense of humour um, that I just feel so honoured that, um, you know, people in the USA have taken Arthur Pepper to their hearts. Um, and I kind of like that. Also, um, you know, in America, you kind of get to read about English traditions, such as making tea and, cook and cake and things like that. Um, so I'm currently editing my fifth book now. So Arthur seems like a very long time ago for me. I think it was five years ago it came out here. So I'm currently editing my fifth one and about to write my sixth one. And um, I'm lucky that I'm with the same publisher in the UK and the USA, which is HarperCollins. And I've been with them throughout my journey. Uh, and it's been a long, exciting journey so far. I'm kind of really keen to encourage other writers, anyone out there watching this who's always fancied the idea of writing themselves and never actually done it. You know, I'm kind of all for encouraging people to have a go. Um, and if anyone's, anyone's got any questions at all about the book, about writing, about myself, I'm just more than happy to answer anything. So I'll hand back over to you. Hi, this is Ellen. I'm going to ask, um, the, there were two questions that came um, into the chat. Um, <clears throat> the first one is, how did the author come up with so many diverse characters since we are currently facing such diversity in the world today, such as Compound with Big Cats, the French writer and his companion helper, the wedding dress seamstress in France, the nosy postal office worker, etc. cetera. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, so the nosy post officer was based on my own little post office. So I don't have a nosy postal officer, but I do have a tiny, I live in a very small village, you know, where kind of, you know, you go in and everyone in the queue for the post office is talking about each other's business. So that kind of just came from that. Um, but yeah, they've, they've all got kind of elements of people I know, people I've come across um, in them. So the tiger in the stately home, We've actually got a, a stately home in England called Longleat, which is famous for its lions. And um, the guy who lives at Longleat, I think he's passed away now, the Marquis of Bath, he kept lions and he dressed in flamboyant claws and um, he had lots of wives called wifelets. Uh, and so he was the inspiration for Lord Greystock and his tigers. Um, and the, the flamboyant novelist in France, I think he just kind of came from, you know, these really trendy beatnik poets in the 60s and you saw pictures of them with the, the stylish black hair and, and, and I've been to Paris. Um, so a lot of these characters just kind of emerged organically as I was writing it. So I didn't plan the charms. I didn't think, right, charm one, charm two, charm three. I kind of was almost going on the journey with Arthur himself. So we started off with the tiger, but then I really didn't know what the second charm would be or the third charm would be. Um, they just kind of, I thought about it when I, when I came to it um, and I wanted this diverse mix of people. And the stories just kind of unfolded as the book unfolded. Uh, and at some points you just kind of, you kind of, it's quite stressful and you don't know where it's going and you think, will I be able to think of an end for the book? Um, but it kind of all flowed and, and all the stories joined together. Thank you. Um, Georgina asks, the title is very clever. Did you think of it or did the publisher? It was mine. It was probably the only book uh, title I've had that nobody 
dabbled with <laughs> that nobody wanted to change. Um, but yeah, I actually remember the moment I was sat in my kitchen. I was just sat on the floor for some reason and I sit on the floor and I spread all my work out sometimes and, and look at it all. And I thought, right, I just need to, I need a name for this book. Um, and I thought, you know, this gentleman, Arthur, he needs a very traditional English name, which is where Arthur came from. But there was the second part of his personality that's more quirky. Uh, more adventurous so uh, Pepper was again straight away was called Arthur Pepper and um, I just thought right charm bracelet charms and the charms are kind of curious where you know where they where they come from but Arthur's kind of a curious character and he's curious about his journey so I just went right yeah that's it curious charms for Arthur Pepper and that was it uh, wrote it down Whereas subsequent books, um, you know, I've maybe come up with 10, 15 titles and then that goes to the US publishers and um, the UK publishers and sometimes we pick different titles for the same book and then it gets quite complicated. Um, but yeah, with this one, the title came straight away and, and everybody uh, loved the title, uh, but they do change it um, overseas. So um I think in Germany they called it, it translates to the man who hid from his neighbour and finally found his heart. The book is called in Germany. And in Italy it's called uh, the man who followed his desires, I think. So yeah, so um, here in England and, and America they kept this, the title, but um, in overseas markets they, they change it to suit the readership. Okay, Tabitha asks, when you started writing this book, do you follow a process like brainstorming and writing down ideas, an outline, or do you just start writing? I did a um, screenwriting course um, about five years before I wrote the book. Um, it was kind of a funded screenwriting course I applied to go on, and it was about four days just in Liverpool. And um, they kind of, it was this teacher um, and we had to watch The Matrix, I remember this, we had to watch The Matrix three times and he kind of broke down the plot of The Matrix and he, and he was kind of showing that each film, every film you watch is broken into these eight sections and these things always happen in the first section, these things always happen in the second section, this thing always happens in the middle and it was absolutely fascinating, I would never realised any of that before. And so every time I watch a film now, I can see these various sections um, of how they're divided up. And so I just very, very roughly will put a piece of paper on a wall, you know, and just write down what might happen in section one, what might happen in section two, just to give me that structure. And I call it like, I think of it as putting um, hangers in your wardrobe, coat hangers in your wardrobe to hang your clothes up. So because if you don't have that little structure in place, all your clothes are just going to be in a pile on the bottom of your wardrobe. And I kind of see that that's what all your words would be like, just spilling out, you know, anywhere. So actually just having that little structure in place, what might happen in each section. Um, that's what I do with each book. Just start off with these little little sections. And then you can think, right, what might happen in the middle? Or that, that will make a nice end scene. And you can just jot things down. And then suddenly it doesn't seem as scary. Because I think sometimes if you start just writing a book and you know you've got to write 80, 90,000 words and you just write at the beginning, uh, not sure where you're going, that's quite a scary big task. Um, whereas this way, just that little bit of planning beforehand kind of helps you know, make it feel more a, a more manageable task. Um, okay, Nicole got two questions in. Who inspired the feeders kid? And also, why didn't you have Arthur go to India? Um, who's sorry, the feeders kid? I'm not sure what that is. Okay. Um, and, and, and Arthur does go to India at the end. So in the, in the last chapter, he does go to India. And um, that's where the last scene is. Okay. Joe, oh, sorry, sorry, the feeders kid. So, sorry, I'm, I'm guessing feeders Bernadette. Sorry, I've just clicked on. So Bernadette is the 
Arthur's neighbour, the cake maker, who likes to make him, um, yeah, makes make him keep uh, cakes and and food. Uh, sorry, it was just the feeder. I was thinking, who's the feeder? Uh, sorry, so uh, Bernadette's son Nathan. So it was the question where the inspiration for him comes from. Yes, that's correct. Yes, uh, Nathan. So Nathan is just a typical teenager. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, he was actually just this really small bit of inspiration, but. When my friend was 19, she met a new boyfriend and she she had a child at age 19 and she met this new boyfriend who was only 16, 17, I think. And the first time I met him, he was in a car with his feet on the on the dashboard, eating a bag of crisps. And he just went, uh, yeah. Uh. And I just thought who is that guy you know this kind of teenage guy uh, eating his crisps with his feet just up on the dashboard of this car um so just that little moment in time that's what made me uh, kind of come back to to nathan who's just this kind of this teenager a bit sulky um but actually as the story goes on his story is a lot deeper you know he's lost his dad he's He's been brought up with his mum, who's fussing over him all the time. Uh, you know, and he's, he's later on in the book, we hear that his mum might have cancer. So poor Nathan, who's, who's 18, 19, he kind of latches on to Arthur Pepper as a bit of a father figure, someone to connect to. They actually connect through the Beatles. So he's quite a sensitive um, figure as the book goes on. But yeah, it all started off from my friend's um, ex-boyfriend with his feet up in the car eating crisps. <laughs> Okay, here, here's a good question from Jo. She asks, it seems that older men are always portrayed as set in their ways, somewhat difficult in so many novels, such as in A Man Called Ove and Arthur Pepper. Why is that? I think, well, I think some of them are, to be honest. Um, I think men, I think women tend to be more sociable sometimes whether it's because uh, women do most of the childcare, so we're the ones at the school gates picking up the children, getting that wider set of friends. I think if women have problems, we're the ones who will pick up the phone to a friend or a relative and have a chat and a glass of wine, whereas men might be more inclined to keep things to themselves. I've got a lot of um, friends or family with husbands who are just quieter, you know, who are happy to kind of sit at home and watch the TV. Um, and in some marriages, they do have traditional marriages where the men might do the finances and the women might do the childcare and women might go out more, um, you know, more socially and so on. Uh, so it's kind of just that traditional, um, just that traditional role um, for some older men. But also men just keeping feelings to themselves more, emotions to themselves more. So I kind of saw um, Arthur Pepper a bit like an onion and it's kind of just peeling off his layers one by one. Um, so, yeah, they're not all set in the ways. I think just when Arthur Pepper came out, there just happened to be another couple of books. I think somewhere, you know, somewhere in Sweden, someone else was writing A Man Called Ove and... Um, I think there's also the unlikely pilgrimage of Harold Fry. I think it was just at that time publishers were taking on books about um, an elder generation, you know, and about men. So I think it was that they just happened to come out at that time. Um, but yeah, and, and I think some people say, yeah, Arthur's kind of, you know, you portray him as this kind of set in his ways and, and so on. But he's only like that for the first six chapters. You know, and he's like that, uh, not because of his age, he's like that because he's bereaved. You know, he's lost his wife of 40 years. He's in a really bad place. His communications broke down with his children. And by chapter seven or eight, you know, he's tackling tigers and uh, learning stories about harems and going to London and, and so on. So, yeah, he's very set in his ways at the beginning of the book. But uh, by the end, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a globetrotter with lots and lots of new friends. Mark asks, have you ever started one book and that one resulted in two or more books? Gosh, um, no, I've kind of, um, 
when I wrote the book, so all the ones that were rejected kind of, kind of go in my drawer. I just kind of, each time I got rejected, I just moved on to another one. Um, and all the ones that were rejected, I just thought, well, they weren't good enough or they're like a different writing style. Um, I suppose they were kind of more women's fiction, younger women's fiction. And then with Arthur Pepper, it kind of moved me into a different marketplace, more kind of commercial uh, commercial stroke literary fiction and I don't really ever go back to any um, that I've written before there's one that I wouldn't mind kind of maybe dusting off but as far as I'm concerned they they were like practice runs for me um, and that book came out and you know I, I never branched off from that story into other books and I've never revisited them so they're just there on a probably on a floppy disk or something somewhere you know, on a really ancient computer. <laughs> I probably can't even access them now. Okay, Louisa asks, I was a little disappointed that Arthur decided to sell the bracelet. Did you think of having Arthur give it to Lucy instead? But I like the reasons he decided to sell it and I really liked that he returned the elephant to India. Yeah, my, my ex-boss um, I used to work with when I wrote the book and um, he told me off and he said, I can't believe Arthur gave the bracelet away. Um, but yeah, I think just it, it didn't actually mean anything to him. You know, he didn't know it. He didn't know the bracelet. And actually it just opened up a big can of worms for him. And the charms didn't actually mean anything to him. Um, and they actually had connotations connecting his wife with other men and other stories. Um, and it just wasn't personal to him or to his daughter, I don't think. Um, and she didn't wear that kind of jewellery at all. And, you know, maybe they had conversations off the page that were in the book. But um, I think he just needed that clean slate, you know, so just to return the elephant to where it came from and just to kind of um, accept Miriam for what she did, for the life she had, that she did love him. And he doesn't need anything else to validate that. Um, so, you know, and, and if that bracelet can go to somebody who can create their own stories, who can have their own charms to it, who will wear it every day and love it, then that's probably better than it just sitting back in a wardrobe. Thank you, Phaedra. There's one more question here in the chat. Do you still live in Oldham? How do your neighbours react to having an author in the community? <laughs> well, I kind of try, try and keep it as quiet as possible. Um, so yeah, I do live um, in Oldham. I live not in the centre now. Um, I live probably about two or three miles out in the countryside. Um, so I'm kind of surrounded by hills. If I compared it to anywhere in America, it's probably similar, more similar to North Carolina, the countryside out there. Um, my parents still live in the same house that I was born in. They live about four miles away, so I've not moved very far. Um, I kind of live in a community where when I took my son to school, we had like a BBC journalist, a musician. Uh, so it was quite normal. They kind of got a lot more attention. They had a lot more glamorous careers than I did. Um, but I would say a lot of my neighbours probably wouldn't, couldn't even name one of my books. I just keep myself to myself. If anyone asks what I do for a living, I just say I work at home, doing a bit of writing in my shed. Um, I don't actually do that many events, really. I'm quite a quiet person. Uh, I'd say 95% of my time is sat, it's sat in my shed where I am now, uh, just making up stories, um, doing admin, that kind of thing. So... Um, yeah, it's kind of very strange when I do actually go out to libraries and give talks and people say, oh, I've read your book and um, yeah, it's quite interesting. But yeah, I, I'm just a very quiet person and I just kind of keep myself to myself and I, I don't go shouting about what I do or anything. <laughs> uh, Jenny just asked, can you tell us a little bit about the next book you will have coming out? Yeah, so we're quite excited about this one. Um, so this one will be my fifth one. Um, I'm kind of just working on the edits at the moment for it. So for anyone who's interested, um, you write a book, it goes to the um, your publisher. 
and you receive um, edits called structural edits and that is their feedback on that's kind of moving around the nuts and bolts of the story you know it might be characters they think should be developed more or so on I never mind that feedback I just think if I've spent a year on something um, by the time I finished it I don't know which parts are working or not so actually having that expert feedback is really useful uh, so we work on structural edits and then we come back with some more edits so I'm on the second set of edits now but this one tells the story of a reclusive writer um, a reclusive writer who's not been seen in public for many years and her cleaner and the writer dies and she leaves her cleaner a very mysterious last wish which is to complete her last ever novel and to keep her death a secret for six months. So it's a story about this cleaner taking on this very strange task from this, um, her employer, this writer who's died, and then trying to find out why she's been left this big task to do and why this writer was such a recluse in the last few years of her life. Um, so, yeah, it's a really interesting story. Really enjoyed writing it and really enjoying just, just doing the edits at the moment. And that one will be out in... Uh, 2000, 2022 yeah it takes so long it takes about a year to write and then about a year in the system year in the publishing system before they come out Georgina asks did you consider Arthur and Bernadette getting together romantically <laughs> I kind of kind of left that as a little hint. Uh, so they might do, they might not. Um, I thought in a year's time that Bernadette and Arthur are probably really good friends, um, doing things together. I think Bernadette is probably pushing him to buy her a nice friendship ring and maybe wants to take things further. And he's very reluctant. He enjoys a company and he enjoys the cakes but I don't think he's looking for anything else at the present. And he did have that little spark with uh, Sylvie, the wedding shop owner in France. So mm, maybe something might develop there. But I kind, of, I kind of like to think that I'm holding my character's hands and taking them to a better place. And then I kind of leave them then to lead their own lives. And um, I kind of compare it to, um, it's like your children going to college. You know, they'll always be your child. Uh, they might get up to things you don't necessarily agree with. You don't know what they're, they're going to get, get up to, but they'll always be your child. So I kind of think Arthur's a bit like my child. I've took him so far, but now it's up to him to go off on his own and, and do his own journey and bend Bernadette off. <laughs> Did you ever have to cut a character that you really liked and why? Um. Yeah, so in my, in my the book I'm working on now, we had a character who's one of my favourite characters called Chloe. And she's a, a reality TV star um, who's very nosy. And um, I loved her, but she just didn't quite fit the book. She just wasn't quite the right fit. Uh, so I did a lot of thinking about her and she's still in there now, but I've just changed her role. So she's actually got a bigger role. I've promoted her. Uh, and she's now a journalist figure in it and um, she, she fits completely now. So yeah, she, the worry was that I, I might have to cut her, but in the end, I just kind of changed her character so she fitted the book better. Um, and I can't really think of anyone else I've had to kill off. <laughs> okay, there are two comments here. Um, Louisa added, I really enjoyed Arthur and plan to read your other books. I have also recommended Arthur to friends. And Michelle commented, love the twist at the end when I assumed that Arthur went to visit his son in Australia, but he really went to India. Well, so thank you for your lovely comments. It's, it's really lovely to, to know when people have um, enjoyed the book, but also recommended it to, to other people. And, I think when you write a book, there's thousands and thousands of books come out every week, you know, and actually just being seen and that book noticed is so difficult. You know, when you go in a bookshop, you've got a choice of thousands. When you go in a library, you've got a choice of thousands. So actually people just reading a book and passing on a message, just saying to a friend or family member, I really enjoyed this one. 
um i just really appreciate that and that's how people get to know about books so so that's brilliant um and the scene with arthur in india i just always had that scene in my head from the very beginning of arthur standing in the sea um you know raising a toast to his wife it was very clear in my head and when you write a book the end image in a book is usually of the opposite to the beginning image so we've got Arthur at the beginning who's bereaved and sorry for himself and a prisoner in his own home and the opposite of that is he's in India you know he's globe trotting he's uh, he's out and about in the world and um, so that's where that came from this very lovely scene of, of Arthur in India and then I thought it'd be quite kind of cute um, that we think that he is going to Australia, but actually it's just that little twist in the end that, he, that he's actually in India. Okay, Georgina asks, do you read a lot? Do you like hard copies or eBooks? Okay, yeah, so I do read a lot. It's, it's quite sporadic. So uh, because I'm going to be editing my own work um, for the next few weeks and the deadlines mean I have to work around the clock. So you're doing evenings and, and weekends and stuff. I probably won't read anything in the next few weeks, but when I'm not got that pressure on, then I do like to read and I never read eBooks. So um, I, don't, I don't know if that sounds awful, but I can't read um, on Kindles or computers. And I think it's just because I'm on a laptop all day, looking at a screen all day. So when I get my own time, I like a nice paper copy of a book. Uh, I like hardbacks, I like paperbacks, but um, I just find ebooks really difficult. And I know they're so easy for people, and you know, you can store so many copies of books on them, you can take them on holiday, and they're really easy. But for me, um, I'm the kind of person who puts six books in my suitcase when I go on holiday, you know, and lugging them around and so on. Um, but yeah, paper copies for me. And also, if I get asked to read for other writers sometimes you get asked to read a book and will you provide a quote um i find it just if they've got a hard copy for me i will try and read it but if it's an ebook i just find it so difficult to do um i just like knowing where you are you know you can see the pages you can feel the book you feel the paper um and i think that comes from um you know again being young and wanting to be a writer my vision was always going into a bookshop and seeing my book on a shelf. And that's what I've always wanted to do. It was never kind of, I want to pick up a computer and, and see a page on it. You know, it was always about physical copies of books. So, yeah. Christina added, what authors do you read and admire? Oh, wow. So my, I've got, I've got my bookshelf here. Uh, so one of the really good books that I, I really like is um, Jojo Moyes, Me Before You. It's such an excellent book. She's so good on the characters. You can see her, I'm just making notes throughout. Um, but also my favourite writer at the moment is Taylor Jenkins Reid, um, who did Daisy Jones and the Six. And she did The Seven Husbands of... Evelyn Hugo which I've got somewhere and so my kind of books that I like to to read I have them uh, to hand um this was another one I read recently The Whisper Man that was really interesting quite creepy um but I usually kind of read this kind of book kind of nice feel good interesting stories uh, yeah so Taylor Jenkins read and she's got a new one coming out called Malibu Rising and I just can't wait to get my hands on it I think I keep kind of seeing it on Twitter and stuff and I just really really want to read that book. Thank you Phaedra that was everything that was in the chat um, so I'm going to turn it over to Karen or Kathy um, if you have more comments to add. I just want to let you know that I have moved on from Curious Charms and I'm now reading the Lost and Found Library. So. Oh, right. I hope you enjoy that one. Yeah, it's got a lovely cover, that one. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's kind of, so I talk about writing, uh, editing book five, but it's kind of really rolling. So um, I think book four, um, which is called The Secrets of Love Story Bridge, is out in the USA just at the moment as I'm editing book five. And we've also just signed off the idea for number six. So as soon as I start editing five, I will start writing six. Um, so it's just kind of 
moving all the time. Yeah, so in Library of Lost and Found was my, my third book. Um, and I think people seem to really like that in, in the USA and Canada. Um, that's been the second favourite, I think, after The Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper. Um, yeah, and I, I love the setting of the Library of Lost and Found. It's all set in the British seaside. So if you do like the seaside, it's kind of like a, a little glimpse of um, British seaside. And, and she's a character, she's a librarian, so it's a hero mm. librarian. And she's kind of a real people pleaser. And it's about this lady, about why she's a people pleaser and how she learns to stand up for herself and solve these family mysteries and say no, you know, and start living her own life. So I really enjoyed writing that one. Okay, thank you. Gabby. I just wanted to say that it seems like a lot of the books that you read are about people who have lost someone or by themselves and then find themselves again. Uh, would you say that that's your favorite type of per person to write about? Yeah, I think I kind of try to tend to write about introverts, introverted people, um, yeah, who kind of need to set off on this journey. It's not kind of intentional. I kind of just write about, it's more the themes, I think, for me. So with Arthur Pepper, it was like bereavement. Um, with the Library of Lost and Found, um, it was very much about, you know, this woman who's just been brought up uh, just to try and please everybody else. And why is that person like that? With my second book, um, Rise and Shine, Benedict Stone, he's married. He's a married man, you know, so he's, he's kind of not that kind of character. Um, but that kind of deals with him and his wife and their troubles and um, gemstones. I was very interested in gemstones with that one. Um, so yeah, I think my characters are kind of quieter, more introverted. I think in book five, um, she's more lively. Um, yes. And in book six as well, there's kind of um, a, a, a cast of characters with book six. Um, a bit like Arthur Pepper, we've got all these different characters. Um, so yeah, I kind of like, and I like the contrast as well, where you have maybe a quieter, con uh, quieter character and then kind of these, these diff very different diverse characters that they come across who help their journey. And I found you through the social media book list called Goodreads. Oh yes, yeah. Have you felt that you have increased your readership by being out on the web or the, on the internet or through these different groups? That's hard to say, isn't it? It's really hard to say. So I know, um, so I've got presence on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Goodreads, Instagram. Uh, my background is marketing and communications. So I've always kind of worked for the business end. Um, I kind of like, I've got a website, my own website, I design my own website, put information on the website. So if people are interested or they want to find out a bit more about your books, um, they can just do a search and find that information. So that's useful that way. Um, I don't really know how readers come across uh, writers. You know, it's in so many different ways, isn't it? It might be stuff on Amazon, going in a bookshop, going in a supermarket, recommendations from friends. Um, so I don't know if anyone kind of sees somebody on Goodreads, Goodreads recommends stuff to people, other newsletters. I don't know, it'd be fascinating, wouldn't it, to find out how people have heard of you. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's increased my readership or not. I don't know. Um, so I do my bit with my publicity and just, you know, giving updates, bits of information. Um, but a lot of the publicity is done by my um, publishers you know, by the publicity team who, who set things up for me. My favorite part from your one web page is on why you write is that when you don't write, you become grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was a piece I wrote for women writers. So I get invited to write different pieces and that was for um, women's writers. I think it's... Um, I can't remember the website, but they invited me to write a piece. And I had just 
done a library event. It was one of the first events I ever did. And unfortunately, there was a lady in the audience who didn't like the book. And she'd written a big long list of everything she didn't like about it. <laughs> and she read it out to me and it just went on and on and on and on. All this list that she didn't like. And um, and I was quite shaken up, actually. Uh, so quite hard. And now, you know, I mean, if people don't like my books, they don't like my books. There's plenty of others out there that they can go and read instead. <laughs> But at the time, because it was one of the first events I'd ever done at a library, it was quite shaking, like just somebody there telling you that they don't like your work. And so actually what kind of came out of that was I wanted to bring something positive out of it. And it was like, well, you might have that opinion, but actually why I write is important to me. And it's a lot more than doing it for money or telling a story there's so many reasons why I write right. and I can't remember how many there are in that article but there's quite a lot um, and I think one of the reasons is because of that lady who was quite rude um, <laughs> and, it, and it was kind of turning that into a, a positive um, for people to know why why I do write but yeah so I kind of, um, I can kind of get a bit grumpy if I don't write and I can get a bit grumpy if I do write. So. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So guys, we are about two minutes till and one minute till. So if we have some closing remarks, now would be a great time to get them out. Okay, Karen. Okay, well, number one, don't give up on libraries. Please keep coming to libraries because we do love your work, okay? And it's yeah. a great place for discourse. Very good place. Um, I want to thank Phaedra for uh, coming and sharing all of her comments and um, for everybody who joined us today. Um, I also have the slide up for the next One Book Your Vote. And that will be, uh, the finalist will be announced in October for the vote during the entire month of October for 2022. So we'll get that from uh, uh, Kathy and her group when they hand over the finalist. And then so uh, just stay tuned for that in the fall. Okay, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, and can I just say, sorry, mm -hmm. am I still alive? Yeah, can I just say just thank you to everybody for reading the book. Thank you for inviting me to do this event. Libraries were a massive inspiration to me growing up, just sitting in Oldham Library when I was a girl, being surrounded by the books and knowing that's what I wanted to do. And actually now being able to talk to libraries across the world and do events in libraries uh, has just been amazing. And I just really appreciate being invited to do this. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm getting a lot of love in the chat. Oh, thank you. Alrighty, well, thank you everybody and thank you Phaedra and Karen and Kathy and Ellen. Um, I will go ahead and end out the meeting now. Have a great day. Hey, thank you Phaedra. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.